All right, welcome everybody. We're going to do a quick video today on the difference between Clang++ and G++. Uh, this is a question I get asked occasionally. Uh, they are two different compilers for C++, is what they are. And so if we have uh, a program here, it's got a little for loop and uh, calls a function a bunch of times and then returns whatever value is returned by the function, just a stupid little program here. Uh, this function's in another file. Open that one up here. You just see it returns 42. So it's just going to call the function. It returns 42 eight times and then returns the result. So if we compile this using G and run it, you can see that the return value is 42. Now, how is it going to be different if we run it with Clang? It's not. Okay, so that's kind of the short answer for a beginning computer science student you're probably not going to see very much difference at all between G++ and Kling++. There is, uh, they take the exact same command line parameters, like if you want to turn on the optimizer for it, dash 03, uh, look at how fast that one ran. <laughs> look at how fast that ran. Yeah, you're, uh, for a small program like this, you're not going to see any difference in the, in the running time. But um, they take the same command line parameters. There is one uh, compile flag that is different for Clang++, and that is dash w everything, which turns on every uh, possible warning you can think of. It's terrible, by the way. Don't use it. Uh, it gives you lots of warnings that uh, are wrong. So, you know, that's the only difference. Uh, it's mainly there, I think, for people who um, are maybe doing tooling and things like that. Uh, it's not, it's not a warning you should use as a student. Um, the one that you should use uh, would be like, wall, turn on all warnings, uh, but all warnings are not uh, all warnings. You have to turn on extra on top of the all. And uh, Clang++ and G++ both support those. So uh, like I said, the only thing that is different is everything here is not supported by G++, probably because it's uh, kind of, it's not really intended for humans, I, I think. You get a lot of bad error warnings on it. Uh, error warnings, uh, a lot of bad warnings on it. Okay, so if they're basically the same, like if you compile and run Hello World, you're gonna get the same result for Clang++ and for G++. You know, and for, uh, I'm not a Windows guy, but you know, like Windows, you know, MSVC, and uh, there's also an Intel compiler called ICC, which I haven't used in probably 20 years. Um, they're all, all of them should give you the same results of your code. And that's by design. Like the C++ standard is well-defined. Uh, if you have some undefined behavior in your code, they might behave differently because it's undefined behavior. And so anything they do is technically correct. But for a well-written program, you will get the exact same output from Clang++, MSVC, G++, ICC, whatever. Okay. So what is the actual difference then? Okay, well, if you get into compilers, and that's like a junior level subject, uh, you'll see that the way that Clang++ and GCC or G++ was written is very different. And so under the hood, um, they're very different architectures. The way that Clang is, is a lot more modular and flexible, which is why you see it used in like, um, if we uh, open it back up here, if I make a bug here, that thing there is Clang. You see right there on the screen, that's Clang running. Uh, it, G, GCC has like a very tightly woven interlocking, you know, design where the front end, the back end all kind of work together, which makes it hard to do things like this. Whereas in Clang, because it's a more modular design, it has different front ends and different back ends and it preserves, uh, you know, some of the original text through, which allows you to use it for things like this, where you're doing like static analysis you're like, look, or, or you can use it as sort of like IntelliSense is what they call it in um, Visual Visual Studio. You can use Cling for things like this, like find bugs in your program. Uh, let's see. Uh, if we do uh, this, maybe. Oops. No, nope, it's not going to warn on that. Um, yeah, it's going to warn on that. Uh, so, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll give you like real time warnings, you can't really use GCC for that. You can like compile with it and like run the whole thing and get the output of it and integrate it. I've done that before uh, a long time ago, but Clang is, is kind of more modular for that. So what you'll see is a lot of these tools, um, 
Static analyzers are tools that like find bugs in your program by looking at the source code, right? So like if uh, we had here an I minus minus, a good static analyzer might look at this and say compile main.cc and say, aha, you have a mistake here. This is a static analyzer I wrote along with some students. And so uh, we have an infinite for loop detected. That's a, that is a static analyzer. Okay. So uh, playing lends itself well to static analyzers, things like that. But again, from the perspective of somebody who's a freshman or sophomore, a uh, computer science student, you're probably just, and you're just using, you know, you're just using plain plus plus or G plus plus or whatever. Uh, you're just not going to see any difference. Now, uh, you might when it comes to like performance. Okay. So like G plus plus, like every compiler, optimizing code is very complicated. Okay. It's, it's actually almost an impossible task to do it optimally, even though that's a bit ironic that it's hard to optimally do an optimizer. It's true. Because a lot of times you just don't know what the user is going to do and you don't know exactly what to optimize for. And so we do things called profiling where you like run the program with the actual user using your code. And then from that, we can figure out, okay, these things get called a lot. So we need to optimize that down, you know, and maybe make trade-offs over here or something like that. And so if you, if you want to look at the difference in how uh, the different compilers optimize that code, uh, there is a great website by Matt Godbolt called, it's at godbolt.org, called Compiler Explorer. And uh, you can punch in your source code on the left-hand side here, and then this is the assembly code on the right-hand side. Now, this won't make any sense to you until you've taken c 45 or, you know, assembly, um, that's an, an assembly class. But you can at least kind of look at it over here and kind of like maybe get an idea of what's going on. So here we've got that source code I showed you earlier. Eight times it's going to call foo. I'm not even capturing the return value now. Uh, I just want to show you, I want to make a point here. So this code here is putting eight into the register EBX. It then calls foo. It decrements EBX by one. And then it jumps, if it's not equal to zero, back up to L2. So this is doing a for loop eight times calling foo. Okay. And we got the optimizer turned all the way up. Um, if we switch this over to a more modern uh, GCC, this is GCC 10, we switch it to GCC 13, you'll see that instead of doing the for loop eight times, it does the for loop four times. So if you see here on line seven, it is actually calling foo twice and decrementing, uh, decrementing the loop counter by two every time. And then it's gonna do four um, loops instead of eight. Um, ostensibly faster you know I'm sure they've I'm sure they've done some timings on it and found that to be faster if you look at uh, Kling uh, x64 let's look at the latest Kling version here you can see Kling just calls foo eight times and so you can see there's there's actually differences in how compilers and even between versions of compilers how they decide to optimize the code if I turn the optimizer off on this uh, version of Clang, you will see that it is going back to a um, it is going back to a for loop version. Let's clean it up a little bit. Here you go. Yeah. So with the optimizer on level one, it does the basically the same for loop that we had with a GCC on O three. But if we turn the optimizer up all the way on this, you see it just fully on. Uh, this is called loop unrolling. It fully unrolls the loop, uh, so you don't have any of that overhead of a branch statement where you, uh, you know, you have to decrement a value, you have to check to see, hey, am I at zero? If you're not, you branch back up and run it again. Uh, and so by, and so by unrolling the loop like this, you've made your program bigger. There are more lines of code here now than before, right? This whole thing now is 13 lines of code, whereas before it was 10 lines of code and the relevant section here has expanded out from basically four lines to eight right? So your code gets bigger and, and there's actual downsides to that. So it's a trade-off. Like I said, like you, you, you might save time, but now you're using it more RAM, more space. It doesn't fit into cache, right? Oftentimes the cache size in your computers is uh, fairly small, you know? And, uh, and so now if your code doesn't fit into cache, you're going to start getting cache misses and it's going to slow down. And the, and the compiler doesn't know exactly how big the cache size is on your computer, you know? So it just has to make guesses. And so there's these trade-offs where they just kind of go like, I don't know, um, let's try un let's try loop unrolling, you know, up to, you know, eight, uh, you know, 
But if I change this to like 80, uh, you'll see, oh, it's, uh, it's actually unrolling all 80. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Let's try it at 8,000. Now it's doing a for loop, okay. So that was interesting. Like it was actually loop unrolling at 80, uh, at 80 loop iterations. I wonder what the, what the threshold is on this. It's wild, that's unrolling at 100. Eh, about 200 for loop time. Okay, so somewhere between 100 and, and 200 iterations of the for loop, it's gonna stop making the executable bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's gonna just go back to a for loop here. So it'll be a little bit slower, but you're not exploding the size of your program. And if we switch over to, you know, G++, Doing x86. Uh, you can see if we cut the loop size down to uh, four, let's say, it will unroll four. If you put it at five, it will unroll five. If you put it at seven, it will unroll seven. But if you put it at eight, then it switches to a for loop. So you can see how there's like these different thresholds kind of built into the optimizers at different threshold levels. And at the end of the day, you can just end up benchmarking your code. You can compile your code with G++, you can compile your code with uh, Clang++, and then see which one's faster. Um, it's probably more effort than I would go to, but there are actual differences. And, and it varies from program to program because there's all these different trade-offs that are made and all these different constants that are programmed into the optimizer that somebody's like, well, this seems like a good value. I mean, it's more than that. They obviously run experiments and things like that. But at the end of the day, they don't know exactly what CPU you're going to be running on. And, and you can pass that in. Like you can, you, there's actually a M arc um, parameter where you can like give it some, give it some information as to the, um, the CPU you're running on. But um, ultimately it's just too complicated for a human to figure out. And so you can just run both and see if, if one's substantially faster and switch and just use that one is, is kind of my, uh, how I'm going to bring this to, to an end. Like if you want to know, should I compile my code with G++ and Clang and you have this big project and it runs for an hour, like just try compiling it both ways. You should not see any difference between the two of them in terms of correctness. Um, but one of them might run 15% faster. So just stick with that. Okay. Now the last thing, uh, that I want to talk about is uh, if you are at the cutting edge, like if you are using like C++ uh, um, 23 or whatever, um, then the latest and greatest features in uh, the C++ standard get implemented by the uh, it's not really maybe part of the compiler. Sometimes it is. Like sometimes the compilers have to change because the language changes. Like they disallow uh, different things like trigraphs are disallowed now if you can't. So that um, uh, used to be uh, not what it looks like. Like if you're trying to print out nani, you know, question mark, question mark, exclamation mark. Uh, this is actually a special character called a trigraph, which was used for people that didn't have like certain key uh, symbols on their characters. It's not an issue anymore. So they, they erased uh, trigraphs from existence. Um, but you'll still get a warning on them, right? So uh, this, the, the language changes over time. Every three years nowadays, C++, the language changes. And they do, sometimes they remove things like trigraphs, and then sometimes uh, they add new things that the compiler actually needs to change. But a lot of this stuff is just changes in the standard library. So they'll add things like this to the standard library. This used to be called lib format, basically. And, um, and when they actually get those done, just depends on the volunteers. So sometimes you'll have a feature available in G++ and not available in Clang++ or vice versa. 
Uh, these days, uh, MSDC, the Microsoft people have actually been keeping up with the standards faster than the volunteers who work on C++ and Clang, um, which was different. But like back in the day, uh, you know, the, the Microsoft people were lagging behind the, the, the volunteers. Uh, and so that's, that's one thing also. So like if you're like using C++23 and um, the feature you want is available in G++ and it's not available in Clang++ yet, then that might be a factor of consideration as to which uh, compiler you use. Uh, if you stick to older standards, I believe all of 20 is done now. I don't quote me on that. Um, but 17 definitely, C++ 17 definitely everything's, everything's in. But if you're like on the latest and greatest, then yeah, you sometimes have to like look at the, <laughs> like, you know, go check the web page and be like, okay, these guys haven't done lib format yet. Uh, or uh, now it's called format. So let me use G++ because I want to switch to something else. And that is really it. Uh, so basically, until you get into like under the hood, there's substantial differences under the hood between Clang and, and, and GCC. They're very differently architected systems. But until you become a junior and get into compilers um, and you're just using them, frankly, there's, there's very little difference between them. Just try them out. And uh, like I said, just see which one's faster for you. If one of them has a feature implemented that you need, use that one. Otherwise, I wouldn't stress too much about it. All right. Peace out.